Well, we have just had church here in this beautiful sanctuary. It's where I'm preaching revival this week. We are studying verse by verse one of the Psalms of David. But really the purpose of the next little while, Bible class, 1 Peter chapter number 4. We need tonight, if we can, to cover three verses of Scripture. 1 Peter 4, 9, 10, and 11. Beautiful verses. Lots to learn in this paragraph of Scripture. Here, here, here's verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. There are a couple of words there we need to discuss. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Verse 10. We almost change subjects for verses 10 and 11. Listen. As every man, and that would include woman, who saved, as every man hath received the gift. What is he talking about, Peter? What are you doing? Even so, minister the same. Minister your gift one to another as good stewards. I'll give you a synonym. As good managers of the manifold grace of God. Now verse 11, I think further explains verse 10, that gift Peter has in mind. If any man speak, so this gift could involve speaking. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, that's an alternative gift, another gift, the gift of ministering. I think I would put it this way, uh, based on the Greek word, the gift of serving. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God gives. If God gives you the gift of ministering, uh, if God gives you the gift of serving, he will give you the strength to do it. That God in all things may be glorified. We are not given spiritual gifts for our own benefit so that we get any kind of praise. No, no. All gifts of the Spirit are that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And then a doxology. What is a doxology? A word of praise through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This paragraph certainly ends on a precious note of praise. Quickly, without much comment, let's get into our text. Verse 9 highlights hospitality. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. This verse actually ties into last lesson. It's just that in last lesson, I didn't have enough time to deal with verse 9, so I didn't even attempt it. Here's the last lesson in a 30-second recap. The end of all things is near. Jesus is coming again. Therefore, here we go, Peter's sermon. Be sober. We studied that word last lesson. Watch unto prayer. We discussed that last lesson. Have fervent charity among yourselves. Last lesson. Now, continuing, be hospitable. Because Jesus is coming again, because the days are short, because the end is near, be hospitable. Again, in verse 9, word for word, use hospitality one to another without grudging. That word for hospitality, let me give it to you. It combines philos, that is a Greek noun that means love, fondness, you like something a whole lot, but love, and xenos, which is the word for foreigner. 
stranger. It is actually the word for somebody different than yourself. The word hospitality, loving others. Loving strangers. Loving people you do not know. The implication is that they're saved. They're among the brotherhood. They're part of our brothers and sisters in Christ, but, but we do not know them personally. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. I'm sure this is what Peter means. In Peter's day, in Peter's culture, if a Christian comes to visit you, he's on a journey, he's on a trip. He's a missionary going to preach. He's an evangelist on his way to a revival. Bring him into your home. Love him. Treat him graciously. Let him sleep in that spare guest room and feed him breakfast as he goes on. Use love of others than yourself. Love of strangers. Use hospitality. And then this clenches it to one another. To one another. To one another, that uses the, uh, uh, the adjective alos, A-L-L-O-S, and it means this, another of the same kind. Another brother, another sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Without grudging. And the word without grudging, ganguzmos, ganguzmos, and uh, what does it mean? Three times. It's only used four times in the New Testament. Three of those times it is translated murmuring. Use hospitality without grumbling, without murmuring. Now, preacher, can you explain that? That fellow came here and I used up two meals that I was going to have next week. That's grumbling. Show love Show graciousness, show hospitality without grumbling in the process. They were taught, the Jews way back in the days of Moses were taught to use hospitality. In Deuteronomy 14 verses 28 and 29, God required a special tithe of the Israelite people that the stranger, the foreigner, and the fatherless, and the widow that are within your gates can come, can come and eat and be satisfied and be cared for hospitality in the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus often, when he was on earth, enjoyed Christian hospitality from believers in himself, from believers in Christ. Luke 10, I'm thinking of that last paragraph, verses 38 through 42. Jesus often resorted to the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. There in Luke 10, uh, Martha's preparing a meal for the Lord and his disciples. That'd be quite a meal, wouldn't it? 13 people at least. And, uh, and Mary is sitting at his feet and learning. Jesus received hospitality. Listen to Paul, Acts 16, 15. Use hospitality one with another without grudging. He has just won a lady to Christ named Lydia. And Lydia got saved and Lydia was baptized in her household. That means all of her servants, her slaves. And she begged us, she beseeched us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house Abide in my house. Let me share with you preachers Christian hospitality. And she, Paul, it's humorous, said she constrained us. She made us. Nobody's ever made Paul do anything unless he wanted to. And she constrained us. When Paul was in that shipwreck, Acts 27, 28, on the way to Rome, when the ship in pieces Broken up, Paul holding on to a plank, drifted into the island of Malta, M-A-L-T-A, -A, an island in the, uh, 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 there on the coast, the Aegean Sea on the coast. They're, they're on their way to Rome, the island of Malta. It's not on the coast, it is an island of Malta, Acts 28, 7. And in the same quarters, there were possessions of the chief men of the island, like the governor Who's, and his name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. Paul 
receiving hospitality. In Philemon, verse 22, Paul says, I'm going to be getting out of jail soon. I believe I'm going to be released soon. Philemon, prepare me a lodging. you got a big house. Prepare me a room. I want to stay with you a few days. That's Philemon, verse 22. And when it comes to uh, leaders in the church, see the pulpit here to church. I've been preaching at this church. They were in a different building in 1980. I've been preaching revivals at this church since 1980. Since 1980. I, I'm just honored to be able to preach there again this year. Beautiful, beautiful pulpit. Leaders in the church, those pastors that filled those pulpits, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 3, of all the requirements for a pastor, <laughs> blameless, Husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, apt to teach, not given to what? Given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. I say hospitality when Abraham received the dear Lord Jesus, the angel of the Lord, in Genesis 18, verses 1 through 5. Oh, we are to love one another, open our homes one to another, Feed one another in a spirit of genuine Christian love and hospitality. That's a discussion of verse 9. May I read it again? Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Now, now today, why would they use hospitality? Their motels, they didn't have motels like with their inns, their places to stay. In that day, I have read in archaeology, they were filthy. You would be in, you, you would have bed bugs crawling all over you. And the article said, if, <laughs> if they had beds, there would be bed bugs, filthy places, rather expensive on top of that. Many Christians couldn't have afforded it. And then known for prostitution, known for immoral activity. They couldn't stay there. Christian homes were open to these traveling, traveling preachers. You get the idea. Preacher, we don't need that as much today. Maybe not, but it's not a bad idea to have the preacher over for supper. Have the missionary uh, there for a meal. Tell him you love him and you're praying for him. Use hospitality one to another. That's an interesting thing, one to another. The New Testament contains, depends on how you define it, from 12 to 16, things were to do one to another. We're to pray for one another. We're to encourage one another. If we see each other beginning to slip in air, we're to admonish, warn one another. My, my, let's get on to verses 10 and 11. We're going to talk now about, well, let me read verse 10 again. As every man hath received the gift of, as every man hath received the gift by every man, this is what he means, no exceptions. Every Christian who is washed in the blood of the Lamb, every man has received, I believe it happens the moment you get saved, the gift. God gives to you a gift. Now I'm going to add an adjective to this gift. I think I'm biblical in doing so. God is going to give to you a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift. Preacher, can you explain the concept of a spiritual gift? I want to start with a verse in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, that's a capital S, but the manifestation, it means the revealing, making himself known. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to every man. The Greek there says every man far and near. Nobody left out among Christ's family, the body of Jesus. As the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To profit with all. God gives to every Christian a gift, a Holy Ghost bestowed gift, hence a spiritual gift to further serve the Lord Jesus Christ. 
to further serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to hammer away on this just for a minute. As every man hath received the gift, so let him minister one to another. There's that one to another, for others of like faith, of like my other believers. Now, preacher, what might this spiritual gift be? Peter, in our two-verse span here, is going to give us two. One's going to involve speaking. One's going to be uh, involve serving. There are several lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. I'm going tonight to teach from Paul's Romans chapter 12 list because it is the most basic of all the lists. Romans 12, 5 through 8. If you're a note taker, write that down. Romans 12, 5 through 8. Being many, we are one body in Jesus Christ. One, we're in one but many members, but one body, Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the head. We are members one of another. We're the body, Jesus is the head. Having then gifts differing. That's what Paul wrote. Having gifts, uh, literally the word there, gifts of grace. Gifts bestowed upon us. Free gifts of the grace of God. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Now get ready. There are going to be seven in this list. Whether prophecy, write that down. There are some with the gift of prophecy. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. I believe that gift of prophecy has nothing to do about saying Jesus will come next March the 18th. No, I'll have nothing to do with it. No man knows the day or the hour. Then what does prophecy mean? To preach, to foretell, to proclaim God's word, God's truth. Some men are gifted with the gift of foretelling the word of God, the gift of prophecy. Paul continues. Or the gift of ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. That word for ministry, it is the word diakonos. And it means it is the word that gives us deaconship. And I don't think here he's talking about deacons at the church. I think he's talking about people God has gifted with the ability to serve. I believe there are men and women with the ministry, the gift of serving, that can prepare delicious meals for the shut-ins. That can crank their lawnmower and cut the grass and do the weed eating for the gentleman, the brother in Christ that just had back surgery. That's the gift of ministry. I'm going to call it the gift of serving. Or he that teacheth, let him concentrate on teaching. There is a spiritual gift of teaching. You know it. Haven't you been around Christians who the hand of God is on them in the area of teaching? They might not can cook a meal. They not, might be able to crank a lot more, much less work on one. They don't have the gift of serving. And, and they might be scared to death in the pulpit trying to preach or, or, or trying to present the gospel to three lost hooligans over there. No, they, but the gift of teaching. God has gifted them to take this book and oh, how they love to study this book. Analyze this book, and then stand behind a lectern, a podium somewhere and teach it with great expertise. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for those with the spiritual gift of teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. There is the spiritual gift of exhortation. And uh, that's paraklesis, paraklesis, uh, parakaleo. And what does it mean? The gift of exhortation is this, the gift of encouragement. They might not be good preaching. They might be petrified to have to teach a Sunday school class. They just can't study it out. But oh, can they encourage. They know just the right word to say. 
They know when to say it. They know how to uplift the downtrodden. I personally believe they know how to sense a discouraged person in the congregation and go to them and put their arm around him and love him. And if it's a lady, love her and encourage her. Dear sisters, thank you for the gift of encouragement. And then Paul says, or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Yes, according to Paul's Romans 12 list, there is the spiritual gift of giving. Now, wait a minute. We're all to give. I personally believe we're all to tithe. I believe, Debbie and I do, we ought to support some missionaries in addition to our tithe. Amen. We all are to give. But there are some especially blessed with the gift of giving. This is the kind when an appeal is made, their hearts are drawn toward that idea of giving. I'll give that missionary $500. Where's it coming from? I don't know. I don't have it. But if God lays on my heart to give it, I promise you, God will send it in. God will provide it. And I'll turn right around and give it. That's the gift of God. Especially in doubt of God. They've got a burden for that business of giving. There's one more. He that showeth mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. The spiritual gift of mercy, of showing mercy. Somebody with the gift of prophecy, they'll say, you're acting like a hypocrite. You're not doing right. You need to get on your knees and, and they'll lay the word of God. I'll repent. We'll confess our sins. And it'll hurt somebody. It'll upset them. That needed to be said. It's the truth, but it'll hurt somebody. Then here comes the gift of mercy. Now what he said is right. You needed to hear it. Don't pout. Don't cry. I love you. Uh, uh, let's go have a cup of coffee. Uh, let me pray for you. Uh, let, me, let me show you pity. Uh, you're hurting. You're smarting because you're hurting. I love you. I love God. Don't you quit on God. And you know what the beauty of this is? No one person can do it all. Somebody say hallelujah. No one person's got all those. Uh, God gives a spiritual gift to those of us who are saved. And that means when we come together, all the gifts are present. Here's what it means. It takes us all to serve God. It takes us all to do the kind of job that our Savior absolutely, absolutely deserves. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, it is a symphony. The Holy Ghost says, I need a little prophecy. I need a little encouragement. I need a little bit of mercy. I need a little bit of serving. Uh, I, I need a little bit. And it's a symphony of praise and service to the Lord. Let's get back to verse 10. As every man is received, by the way, it's fun. Try to figure out your spiritual gift. It'll be that area of the Lord's service that you can do with the most ease and with the most joy. It won't scare you to death to do it. You will be a supernatural at that gift. Oh, I'd love to talk more about it. Every man has received the gift. And if you have, minister the same. Get out there and do it. Get out there. Minister means to run errands. Get busy. Cause the dust to fly behind your feet. The same one to another as good stewards. That's a word for the slave that manages the whole household. As good to find your place, get in it and perform. Get in it and serve as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If everybody would find God's will for their life, if everybody would find God's gift for us, and we all did it in harmony. Oh, what a testimony to the manifold grace of God. They would be singing amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That word manifold, it is such an interesting word. Pokylos. Pokylos. I think the Greek teacher would say poikilos. Poikilos. Eight times in our New Testament it's translated divers, diverse, different, but it literally means, get this, multicolored. Peter actually said, I want to talk about the multicolored grace of God. This is strange, but I'm going to illustrate. If you are going through a period of your time, you need the red grace of God, he's got red grace. If you need the blue grace of God, He's got blue grace. If you need purple grace, he's got the color grace for just what you need right now in your life. Hallelujah. Verse 11. Verse 11. If any man speak, 
There are the speaking gifts that would include prophecy, proclaiming the word. That would include exhortation, speaking, kindness, and uplifting words. That would include the gift of teaching. Uh, and the Bible has three things to say about this doctrine. Look, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That word for oracles uses the word logos as its root. If you're going to speak, be sure you're right. Be sure you got the word. Be sure you got the Bible with you. Be sure that you're telling it just like, don't you? So many people say, the Lord told me to tell you. If you're going to say that, the Lord had better told you to tell them that or you're taking God's name in vain. If you've got a speaking gift, speak as the oracles of God. Be right. Be biblically accurate in what you say. Mm. And if any man minister, you have the serving gift, I'm going to cook supper for you. I'm going, I'll just stick with my little son. I'm going to mow your lawn. I, I'm, I, I'm going to come. I heard you've got a financial need. I've got $100 on the lay there on your table. And you're going to take it because God told me to give it to you. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God gives. We don't do this spiritual gift business in our own strength with the ability that God has given to us. That word ability, listen to it, ixus, I-S-C-H-U-S, ixus. And what does ixus mean? Primarily physical strength. I preached in revival tonight. Now everybody's gone but the pastor. I'm recording a meditation and I don't know where it comes from. I got physical strength. I could, maybe could preach again if I needed to. Where'd that physical strength? Ixus, physical strength, ability given by God to do his work. You perform your spiritual gift of the glory of God. He'll give you strength. He'll give you might. He'll give, do it with the ability God gives you. Why? Why? I don't encourage to get glory. I don't give a hundred dollars so somebody will brag up. No, we don't do this spiritual gift business for that God in all things may be glorified. That God in all things may be glorified and glorified doxadzo. And what does it mean? That God might be uplifted. I'll give you some synonym. That God might be bragged on. Uh, that God might be praised. Uh, that God might uh, be congratulated at his plan of spiritual gifts. Hallelujah. That God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Jesus, he's my savior. Christ, he's my Messiah. Through Jesus Christ. Jesus, his earthly name. Christ, his heavenly name. Uh, through Jesus Christ. Watch this. To whom be Praise to whom be glory forever and forever. Amen. To whom be praise. This, I mentioned it earlier. This is called a doxology. What is a doxology? An uplifting of glory. An uplifting of thanks. An uplifting of benediction. Good words said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that he would be given all the praise, glory, that he would be given all uh, the dominion. The word dominion there is kratos, K-R-A-T-O-S, and it means manifested power, manifested might, uh, put on display my, oh God, through the preaching, through exhortation, through giving, through the showing of mercy, through the gift of God, may you, may your power and your strength be demonstrated and your church come closer together. Your church minister to each other to whom be praise and glory forever and ever. Let me give you that. Forever and ever. Ice eon. Ice eon. It means into the ages of the ages of the ages into millennium after millennium after a millennium, when we've been there 10,000 years by forever and ever, glory to him, amen. And the word amen means truth. The word amen means solid as a rock. The word amen says built, thank God built on the right, the right foundation. Spiritual gifts 
and a little bit of a lesson, Peter style, on how to use them. And have hospitality among yourselves. Quickly, another example of hospitality, they opened their homes and the church met in their